Marcel Stutzler, qui est professeur de sociologie à la School of History, Philosophy and Social Science de l'Université Bangor, Pays de Galles, qui est membre du Centre for Jewish Studies à l'Université de Manchester, et euh, dont les travaux, toute une série de travaux, évidemment, portent sur euh, le racisme, l'antisémitisme, dans leur relation avec la modernité, le libéralisme et le nationalisme. Alors, euh, Mich euh, Marcel Stutzler euh, est auteur de plusieurs euh, ouvrages, notamment « The State, the Nation and the Jews »,« Liberalism and the Antisemitism Dispute in Bismarck's Germany » en 2008, et euh, on, a, on note notamment aussi un ouvrage en 2014, euh, « Antisemitism and the Constitution of Sociology ». Donc il nous propose euh, aujourd'hui un exposé intitulé « Still fighting the Zionist Machiavellians, continuities of antis, antisemitic defenses of good capitalism from bad ». Et, euh, et voilà. Donc je propose de lui céder tout de suite la parole pour un exposé de 20 à 20, 25 minutes, ce serait l'idéal, maximum, grand maximum 30 minutes, pour pouvoir ensuite avoir notre échange de 45 minutes à partir des trois exposés qui ont été réalisés. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour m'avoir invité. C'est un plaisir, as well as un honneur, d'être ici. Still fighting the Zionist Machiavellians, continuities of anti-Semitic defenses of good capitalism from bad. As it is widely assumed, the protocols of the elders of Zion were composed towards the end of the 19th century by agents of, oh, I wanted to put my stopwatch on, so I, so I know uh, how much I am over time. <laughs> Where is it now? Um, Where's the watch here? I can't find the watch. Uh, ah, here. Sorry for that. <laughs> Now nothing can go wrong. Composed towards the end of the 19th century by agents of the Russian secret police, presumably intending to intervene against any liberalization of Russian imperial politics and were then used as counter-revolutionary propaganda in 1905 and after 1917 in particular. The Russian Civil War provided the context in which their impact history really took off, to the effect that they are now considered the most important document of contemporary anti-Semitism, with no sign of their influence abating. The authors used as their principal source a text then widely available as a popular anti-Semitic pamphlet that had initially formed part of the 1868 novel Biarritz by the German popular fiction author Hermann Goethe, a figure of petty bourgeois background with links to the most reactionary section of the German aristocracy. His many popular novels seem to have been generally read as having been based on real events. They all tend to explain contemporary events as having been caused by a variety of small groups of conspirators. The episode that became the basis of the protocols describes a meeting of the elders of the 12 tribes of Israel on the Jewish cemetery of Prague discussing strategies for securing world domination. These amount to a comprehensive program that reflects some important current socio-economic and political tendencies. Credit ought to, be, ought to become more easily available in order to bring states and the little people into dependency and poverty. Real estate needs to be appropriated and commodified by bringing the aristocracy into debt. Commercial freedom ought to ruin the crafts and replace them with factories. Education must be separated from the church and the church destroyed. The military replaced by mere police. The Jews should be given access to state office. They should aim to dominate speculative trade, the arts, sciences and medicine, everything that involves theory and speculation, as opposed to honest hard work. Money should be treated like any other commodity and laws against usury should be rescinded. Intermarriage with Christians and the use of Christian women as prostitutes is proposed, as well as the domination of the media. Perhaps the most interesting passage of Goethe's text 
is the speech by the representative of the tribe Zebulon. That's a longish quote now from the original text from Biarritz. Ours is fundamentally a conservative people that is committed to the old and the solid. Looking to our advantage, though, demands now that we join, indeed gain leadership of the movements that are reverberating through the world. It cannot be denied that the urge for reform permeates our time. But its primary notion is that of material reform, that is, the reform of the material state of the wanting classes. Such reform would require the wealthy classes to make sacrifices, first of all capital. Capital, though, is in the hands of Israel. It was Israel's task, therefore, outwardly to take part in the movement so as to direct it from the field, <coughs> from the field of social reform to that of political reform. The popular mass, as such, is always blind and stupid and, and allows itself to be led by those shouting loudly. Who can shout as loudly and prudently as Israel, though? That's why our people are the first on the rostrums, in the newspapers, and in the associations of the Christians. The more associations and the more assemblies, the more discontent and the less willingness to work. This cannot but lead to increasing impoverishment of the people, their servitude under those who own the money, and the growth of our wealth. Anyway, every movement makes us money because it ruins the little man and increases debt. The insecurity of the thrones increases our power and influence. Therefore, maintenance of continuous disquiet. Every revolution adds interest to our capital and brings us closer to our goal. In this speech, Goethe manages quite ingeniously to combine the two principal strands of modern antisemitism. The notion of the Jews as conservatives, often advanced by liberals and socialists who accuse the Jews of being in league with the old regime, and the notion of the Jews as revolutionaries, often advanced by conservatives. Goethe presents the Jews here as essentially conservative, but for cynical and Machiavellian reasons, they run the false flag operation of leading all social movements of the present, because uncertainty and disquiet as such are in their interest. The most original point here is that the Jews deliberately deflect the demand for social reform to that for political reform, implying that social reform that would redistribute some wealth from capitalists, presumed to be Jewish, to the poor would be a good thing. This is in keeping with the conservative idea of the social monarchy and anticipates the logic of the Bismarckian welfare state. The Jews are here presented as being the leaders of revolution only because they are even more conservative than conservatives like Goethe himself or rather the wrong kind of conservatives, who, seem to who seems to embrace the idea of social, albeit not political, reform. <coughs> the Jews instigate revolutionary movements because, as capitalists, they want to prevent reasonable social reform by the benign monarchy. The presumably Russian authors of the protocols used the scene from Biarritz as a skeleton, which they then fleshed out with other materials, chiefly Maurice Joly's 1864 Dialogue aux Enfers entre Machiavel and Montesquieu, to the effect that 40% of the text of the protocols seems to have been adapted from Joly. Interestingly, while most of the material put into the mouths of the Jewish elders stems from Joly's Machiavelli character, some also stems from Jolie's Montesquieu. The elders of Zion most represent what Jolie understood to be the cynical Machiavellian enemy of the Enlightenment that is represented in turn for Jolie by Montesquieu as the philosophical backbone of the ideas of the French Revolution. Things are made even more complex by the fact that Jolie's character Machiavel is not exactly designed to be a truthful representation of the real Machiavelli, 
who was no cynic, but himself an early representative of the Enlightenment and a key influence on Hobbes, for example. A dialogue between Machiavelli and Montesquieu in fact provides a good impression of the dialectic of the Enlightenment. Jolie's Machiavelli is, though, enriched with Saint-Simonian ideas, as Jolie's intention was to produce a satire on Napoleon III, whose regime, theorized as Bonapartism or Caesarism by the Marxist tradition that understands it as the first proto-fascist model of governance, indeed relied on the support and involvement of prominent Saint-Simonians. Jolie's text attacks an intense state-centric modernization project with proto-fascist characteristics. As a result of the inclusion of this rather complex and highly reflective material, the protocols of the elders of Zion lack entirely the propagandist coherence and straightforwardness of Goethe's Gothic fantasy. Their puzzling incoherence must have contributed, though, to their enduring influence. The authors of the protocols might have intended to increase the text's plausibility by including a lot of what the Tsar would have found to be well-established techniques of absolutist statecraft, which is also reflected in the fact that Hitler, a few years later, appreciated the protocols as his campaigning manual. Of the Machiavellian Zionist elders of the protocols, it is true what Machiavelli says very perceptively in the prologue to Marlowe's The Jew of Malta, admired I am of those that hate me most. The elders of Zion are involved in a ruthlessly Machiavellian conspiracy aimed at an absolute global dictatorship that resembles ultra-authoritarian state socialist or even fascist modes of governance, employing genuinely liberal or democratic demands only in a negative way as means of destabilizing and destroying the existing order. The authoritarians and fascists who believe in the message of the protocols and who do not think of democracy and liberalism as viable forms of politics anyway must have found a lot to like about and learn from the elders of Zion. In their minds, these original Zionists are first of all a competing racket, which is what makes them seem both plausible and dangerous. The protocols also confirm the ultra-conservative conviction that proponents of liberalism and democracy cannot possibly be acting in good faith, unless they are from the stupid, deluded, and ultimately unthreatening vulgar mass of common people, a belief that is perhaps their principal Achilles heel. Time and again, authoritarians are surprised when common people do in fact struggle for democracy. The connection of Machiavellism, Jews, and conspiracy goes back a long way. It was probably first articulated in England. The country that pioneered modern antisemitism with the first systematic expulsion of Jews in 1290 was in the first stages of a historical process that would also pioneer capitalism, the nation state, modern industry and football, fiercely paranoid. The paranoid style in English politics is reflected in Marlowe's play, the famous tragedy of the rich Jew of Malta, written around 1590, whose protagonist, the merchant Barabbas, combines features of three of the major conspiracy theories that preoccupied European minds in the modern period. Barabbas is a Jew, but of Catholic spirit, i.e. he is not only money-grabbing, but Machiavellian, who acts in league with the Turks, a word that was at the time synonymous with Muslims against the plucky island people of Malta. That should sound familiar. Although in good Machiavellian fashion turns against them too, which is where he tragically fails. Barabbas is literally inspired by Machiavelli, who then represented very Italian Catholic wickedness to the English public. Machiavelli speaks, in fact, the prologue of the play, pointing out that he just arrived from France where he instigated the St. Bartholomew massacre of the Huguenots. Huguenots at the time, apparently without any evidence, 
seem to have thought that reading Machiavelli had influenced the mindset of the French Catholics who committed the massacre. The Machiavelli character declares that he has come to present the tragedy of a Jew who smiles to see how full his bags are crammed, which money was not got without my means, without Machiavellian means and asks the London audience not to hold Barabbas amoral and non-religious ruthlessness against him. The so-called Machiavellism is about power, not wealth, though, although Barabbas seems to adopt Machiavellism as a means for getting rich, and only upon losing his wealth dedicates himself to revenge, an old motive from theological antisemitism. Marlowe, like Shakespeare or any sensible Londoner then as now, was not critical of wealth, but, if at all, of how one gets it. Different from Barabbas, the elders of Zion seek wealth not for its own sake, but as a means for world domination. They seek power. The puzzling fact that out of the many anti-Semitic texts from the 19th century, it was the protocols with their emphasis on conspiracy for world domination as an end in itself that became the undisputed global top seller could perhaps be understood to mean that in the contemporary world, the obsession with invisible power is more universal than the concern with wealth and how it is produced. The various initial publications of the protocols tell different stories about their origins. The 1917 publication, that is probably the most important one, links the protocols to the first Zionist Congress that took place in 1897 in Basel. Since 1917, also the year of the Balfour Declaration, of course, it is safe to assume that readers of the protocols, one of the most widely read books in modern times globally, make an at least subconscious connection between the Zionism of the elders of Zion and the actual movement of Zionism and subsequently the state of Israel. Whoever is daft enough to believe that the protocols were produced or presented by Theodor Herzl in a secret back room at the 1897 Basel Congress must surely assume that the state of Israel plays an important part in the global Jewish conspiracy. The Nazis, the most extreme students of the protocols, took the not yet existent Zionist state to be a state that serves to undermine the concept of the state and the statehood of all other states. Not only Nazis, for sure, fail to comprehend that the modern state is constituted and reconstituted continuously by the capitalist world society whose political form the state system is. Students of the Protocols believe instead that rootless Zionist cosmopolitans, the original citizens from nowhere, cunningly planned to become rooted in a particular somewhere in the form of a state-destroying state. If the community of genuine states wanted to take back control and regain sovereignty, seek liberation from the uncanny abstract force that undermines their self-determination, they had to destroy the Jews and their state-shaped entity. Bizarrely, this mystical fascist idea found an echo in post-Stalin Stalinism, where, according to Polyakov, the increasing demonization of Zionism corresponded to and compensated for the increasing accommodation with the West in the 1960s. From there, it spread into a range of Stalinist-influenced nationalist ideologies in the context of Cold War and post-World War II decolonization. The single most important text for understanding modern antisemitism is Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto. Its first section sets out with relish why the existing ruling classes of Europe had to fear capitalist modernity that increasingly, whether they liked it or not, was becoming the material basis of modern domination and exploitation in which they could only adopt or be swept away by. 
The bourgeoisie, by which they actually meant capit the capitalists, as Engels later clarified in a footnote, destroyed all ideas of natural superiority or hierarchy. All sentimental illusions and prejudices, including religion, family, patrimonialism, parochialism, nationality and sloth, rational, egotistic, centralizing, state-building but cosmopolitan capitalism is here truly the end of ideology as new illusions are outdated before they can even ossify, as they write. Communism appears as a specter, a conspiracy of shady, isolated, radical individuals, only to those who fail to see it as the product of the dialectical dynamics of the bourgeois mode of production. Behind the alleged uncanniness of communism stood the Jekyll and Hyde character of capitalism itself, that not only has destroyed the old regime, but also has produced in the proletariat, whose humanity it negates, its own imminent negation. The remainder of the manifesto elaborates on the notion that communism is not that specter-like conspiracy, but the light-as-day consequence of the bourgeois order, and lays out what the communists must avoid being, nationalist, sectarian, secretive, positivist, authoritarian. The communists only need to abolish institutions that are, in their bourgeois form, anyway chimerical already, such as property, nationality, and family. No mystery here. No secret blueprint. No conspiracy. Understanding the dialectics of capitalist civilization itself and the dialectical dependency of the communist movement on capitalist modernity requires dialectical thinking, probably a product of any individual's strongly felt experience of non-identity. In a world of identity, admitting non-identity is hard to do. One does not learn dialectics in the seminar. Those lucky or unlucky enough to be identical to themselves, happy masters in their own house, although perhaps not happy about much else, are likely to find ways of de-dialecticizing and obscuring the dialectical realities of our civilization. To recognize the dynamics of the capitalist mode of production as the engine on which rests our hope of overcoming capitalism is perhaps the hardest thing to think. It is easier to think either of ourselves as the other of capitalism that will confront and defeat it, or else to confront bad from the standpoint of good capitalism. Robbed of its dialectical dynamics, thinking becomes dichotomous. Most of the tendencies of socialism that are critiqued in the third section of the manifesto do just that. And here is where anti-Semitism as the socialism of fools becomes relevant. In a world that has the nation state for one of its principal political structures, nationalist socialism is the most obvious way of imagining benign productive capitalism. As anything national can easily tip over into its racial complement, depending on context, capitalism with, say, German characteristics can morph into Aryan capitalism and back, and needs to define itself against the foil of French, English, Yankee, or Jewish capitalisms, as the case may be. The dichotomy between a German and a Jewish kind of capitalism, the former concrete and wealth-creating, schaffend, the later abstract, exploitative, and value-appropriating, raffend, is one of the elements of continuity that link the anti-Semitism of 19th century liberals, such as Gustav Freitag or Heinrich von Treitschke, to Hitler's. Without a concept of capitalism that differs from that which underpins anti-Semitic anti-capitalism, it is impossible to make the argument that the latter is in fact not an anti-capitalism at all. Marx spent the two decades after 1848 to develop this concept. The helplessness of liberals and most socialists in dealing with the issue of anti-Semitism in any but its most easily recognizable racist forms 
stems not least from their lack of a, of a theoretically grounded critique of capitalism. The phrase left-wing anti-Semitism may refer to anti-Semitism on the left and anti-Semitism of the left. The former would be the case of anyone on the left who holds the forms of anti-Semitism that are to be expected in the context such as the social milieu or nationality inhabited by this individual. The latter would be forms of anti-Semitism specific to the tradition of the left. Now, the notions of left and right are usually defined in terms of a commitment to the idea of either the ontologically given as well as normatively desired equality versus the natural inequality of all human beings. As this terminology dates from the time of the French Revolution, the notion of the left still resonates with liberté, égalité, fraternité. Left-wing antisemitism is therefore in the first instance an antisemitism that presumes that there is something in the essence or spirit of the Jews that makes them impediments to the pursuit of the ideas of the French Revolution. The Jews are by their nature supporters of the status quo or of reaction. This was the position of Bruno Bauer, which Marx challenged in his famous On the Jewish Question. Furthermore, left-wing antisemitism could also be defined as antisemitism that follows from a mechanical, dogmatic, and undialectical interpretation of these ideas themselves, to which Adorno reacted with his famous formulation of, quote, the state of things where one can be different without fear, in minima moralia, which I take to be a disguised reference to communism, the state of things we long for. This leads to a complex question that is central to critical theory. How can we articulate a defense of difference within the framework of a commitment to equality? One of the classic treatments of this problem is, of course, Marx's on the Jewish question. <coughs> Reflections on how capitalist modernity creates, but also undermines equality and sameness, difference in identity, particularism and universalism, in their dialectical interplay, can be found in relevant contemporary discussions of race, class, sex, and gender, and others. Critical theory links these issues to the commodity form, which produces the totalizing dynamic characteristic of modern society, whose chief mechanism of mediation it is. The capitalist mode of production produces the schizophrenic reality of total mind-numbing sameness based on antagonism, separation, and a bad infinity of particularisms. Etienne Balibar put it well when he remarked that racism is encore an universalism. This is the dialectic of left-wing racism. Whether it can in practice be disentangled from ordinary racism, including antisemitism, that any leftists may well subscribe to because leftists is not all that they are, I'm not sure. The anti-Semitism of anti-imperialist or post-colonial nationalists is, within a world where the nation-state is the established political form of capitalist normality, ordinary right-wing anti-Semitism. Although many would argue correctly that modern nationalism itself is in fact linked to the ideas of the French Revolution and has historically been an aspect of most liberal, democratic and socialist movements. Seen in this perspective, nationalist antisemitism should be categorized as a form of left-wing antisemitism. My interest in these matters goes back to a strange encounter that took place in 1987, when I lived in Hamburg, having finished school but not yet being quite disillusioned enough with the world to become a university student, and was involved in the autonomous movement of the unemployed. I had visited a friend in London, and had met there through him an older Jewish Frenchman, a Trotskyist, who had briefly lived in Israel, apparently in order not to be drafted to serve in Algeria, which he left subsequently in order not to be drafted into the Six-Day War, and eventually ended up living in London. He had recommended to me the two books on Zionism by Lenny Brenner, who was mentioned yesterday, 
I read and liked them, although today I would have strong reservations about some of Brenner's judgments and his use of sources. And on return to Hamburg, I went to the bookshop Schwarzmarkt, Black Market, a bookshop associated with the Hafenstraße squad, which was near where I lived at that time. I showed them the books and recommended them to stock them, as this was the go-to place for internationalist and anti-imperialist literature. The gentleman who worked in the bookshop on that day looked at the Brenner books for two seconds and then replied, why would we stock books on Zionism written by a Jew? I don't think I had much of a reply to this statement at the time, but it certainly was a factor in my turn several years later uh, to studying this kind of thing at university. It also explains, on the other hand, that I'm not persuaded by the instances of left-wing anti-Semitism currently discussed in the UK, that there is a massively shocking phenomenon to be called new anti-Semitism. Given that unfiltered access for just about anyone to electronic media that record, distribute, and preserve in searchable form any opinion anyone may have on anything has only existed for a decade or so, it seems impossible to make any judgment as to whether anti-Semitic attitudes as opposed to the manifestations of such attitudes, have increased or decreased over a longer time scale. It seems fair to say, though, that the polarization of publicized opinion on such matters has increased. <coughs> Meanwhile, the spirit of the protocols is in robust health. The, killers of the, the, the killer of Pittsburgh apparently thought Jewish Machia villains were secretly orchestrating Latino immigration and the defense of the American nation and the good kind of individualistic, God-fearing capitalism it embodies required killing Jews, any Jews. We cannot know whether he seriously assumed that the old folks of Squirrel Hill were actively involved in organizing the evil caravan of violent Latinos craftily enhancing their dangerousness through an admixture of Middle Eastern terrorists whom the hidden hand had spirited to Honduras. These impoverished Catholics would surely not have made it anywhere near the land of the free, though, without the support of the suspiciously Jewish-sounding charity Pueblo Sin Fronteras, the people without borders, no doubt lawyers from nowhere financed by George Soros. There's no such thing as anti-Semitic anti-capitalism. Very much alive is, though, the anti-Semitic version of the search for a way of politically framing capitalism in such a way that it does not threaten established societal hierarchies of power, including those of nation, race, caste, creed, sex, sexuality. Anti-Semites want capitalism minus its anomic or as Comte might have put it, its critical dimensions. That is, minus its negative, identity-destroying effects that Marx and Engels thought were the real basis of our hope to transcend the misery of our civilization. 170 years after the Manifesto, the corrosiveness of capitalism remains ours to embrace. Thank you very much. <laughs>